Hi, my name is Dave, amateur radio call sign AB7E. I recently got interested in trying to work some of the ham radio satellites, but I haven't been obsessed enough about it to buy a rotator with both azimuth and elevation capability. It doesn't take a lot of gain to work the satellites anyway, so the idea of using a pair of QFH antennas intrigued me, one for the uplink and the other for the downlink. A QFH antenna is reasonably compact and has a hemispherical pattern, as you can see from this elevation plot that I generated using uh, the modeling program EasyNIC. Uh, it's like a dome-shaped pattern over your location with similar gain in all directions. QFH antennas have a bit of gain, about 4 dB over isotropic. The theoretical gain would be 3 dB over isotropic since they only beam upward, but a QFH typically has a little bit less at the horizon and a little bit more overhead, uh, giving you about 4 uh, overhead. They have a circular polarization that is important for working the satellites. Some of the ham radio satellites have right-hand circularly polarized antennas, but circularly polarized ground station antennas also help to compensate for rotation or tumbling of the satellites that have linearly polarized antennas. And importantly, a QFH antenna isn't difficult to build, as I hope you'll be able to see here. Most ham radio satellites operate on the 2 meter and 70 centimeter bands, one or the other for the uplink and then the other for the downlink. I've already posted a video here on YouTube showing how I built a QFH antenna for the 70 centimeter band. Uh, that's at 435 megahertz or thereabouts. And I'll include a link to that video in the description below this video. This video will show you how to build one for 146 megahertz. A QFH antenna is comprised of two rectangular full wave loops oriented vertically and nested perpendicularly to each other with a spiraling half twist to the loops. To get right hand polarization, the twist goes to the left since a QFH antenna is fed at the top, not the bottom. A typical configuration makes one loop slightly shorter than would be resonant at the desired frequency and the other loop slightly longer than would be resonant at that desired frequency. The lengths are chosen such that the smaller loop has a phase of minus 45 degrees and the longer loop has a phase that is positive 45 degrees. The loops are fed in parallel at the top of the antenna to result in a net zero phase difference at the target frequency, but with the two loops now having the 90 degree phase difference necessary to create a circular polarization. There are several websites showing the construction of a QFH antenna using PVC tubing for the internal mast, as well as the spreaders that hold the spiral loops in place. And they work. I've built a couple of antennas like that. But I dislike the idea that you build the supporting framework and then have to match the lengths of the wires to the structure. It's the wire lengths that are important, and it seems more logical, uh, and in my opinion more repeatable, to cut the wires to the exact length you want and then design the supporting structure to be able to adapt to that. That's how we get to what you see laid out here in front of me. To begin with, there are some 3D printed collars sized to fit around a 1 inch PVC tube, uh, just sprinkler type tube. And each collar has arms radiating from it. The arms have a 3 8 inch diameter hole that can hold short lengths of 3 8 inch diameter fiberglass rods that act as spokes to hold the wires. The collars fit snugly around the PVC but are loose enough that they can turn radially and slide axially along the tube. The fiberglass rods have 1 8 inch diameter holes drilled in them out towards the end uh, at a prescribed distance from the center to hold the wires and of course the rods can turn into the arms. The collars were 3D printed with PETG filament uh, at a 0.2 millimeter layer height. I'll include a link to the STL files once I upload them to the Prusa printables.com website. Most of the designs for QFH antennas show three sets of spokes, one at the top, one in the middle, and one at the bottom. I decided to go with four of them to give a bit more determinant shape to the loops. 
the sections of fiberglass rod are cut from four foot long, three eighth inch diameter electric fence posts that can be purchased from several places, both from online outlets and various farm and ranch suppliers. I paid $2.19 each for the ones I got from a local tractor supply store. And if you cut the rods about five and a half inches long, you can get all 16 um, spokes from just two fence posts. The wire I used is simply 12 gauge bare copper wire taken from some common Romex type household cable. It's readily available, easy to strip, and not too difficult to straighten by pulling it over a round mandrel. And I just use the uh, handle of a um, socket wrench for that. The top collar is different from the middle one so that it can hold a standard SO239 UHF chassis mount connector. And that's where we make the connection uh, of the wires um, at the top there. I start with a length of PVC tube roughly 30 inches long. The collar with the SO239 goes at the top. The two middle collars go, well, as you might expect, in the middle. And the two collars with just two arms go at the bottom. The two loops are different enough in length that even with the difference in diameters, the bottom ends of the loops will end up in different positions along the mast. So it is necessary to, separate, to uh, use separate collars there. The feed point for a QF, QFH antenna is at the top. If you feed it correctly, the antenna has what is known as a backfire pattern that points upwards. That means that you have to run the coax up through the antenna. So I use a short length of coax that is just a bit longer than the PVC tube so that I can build this thing. And then I later connect it to a longer length of coax for the run to the transmitter or receiver. Loops are a balanced load, and if you simply feed them with unbalanced coax, you risk having common mode currents on the outer surface of the shield of the coax. And those currents can create fields that conflict with the desired field of the antenna. That can be especially problematic when you're trying to generate circular polarization. So some way of blocking those currents is uh, highly desirable. Lots of construction articles for a QFH tell you to just wind a few turns of the coax to create some blocking inductance. But in my opinion, that's a sloppy and unreliable solution. It's unlikely that anyone actually knows how much inductance they're creating. And more important, um, more importantly, how much turn to turn capacitance they have that could be actually defeating the inductance. In my opinion, a better solution is to use ferrite cores. You need a lot of them to get a lot of choking, but you don't need very many to get enough choking and they are fairly broadband uh, as a result. I measured these type 43 chokes with my nano VNA and found that they each had about 150 ohms impedance at 145 megahertz and that they scale linear linearly. When I added more of them, I got a, uh, an expected, what I expected for the additional impedance. So four of them gives me about 600 ohms and that's enough, I think, to keep the pattern pretty clean. I pre-cut the wires to the precise lengths I wanted and then marked the middle of each wire with a piece of colored tape. I made bends in the wires at that, at that midpoint that corresponded to where they would fit in the res, uh, respective bottom spokes. Uh, you'll see that in the, uh, in the video here. I aligned all of the holes in the end of the fiberglass spokes as if there wouldn't be any twist in the loops. 
That makes it much easier to feed the wires. And trust me, I tried it the other way. It doesn't work very well. And then once the wires are fully inserted, the collars and the spokes can be gradually rotated to make the proper half turn twist. Here I have inserted the wires from the bottom and threaded them linearly through all of the spokes. Keeping in mind that the objective for this design has been to depend upon the length of the wires being as accurate as possible, the end of the wires are soldered to the SO239 connector first and the collars and spokes are then adjusted as necessary for position and, or in position and rotation to form the loops into the proper half spirals. Note how the wires are soldered together at the SO239 connector. To get the proper phasing for a backfire pattern, that's what you want to beam this thing upwards, the wire from the longer loop should be to the left when looking down at the top of the antenna. I'm talking about the, uh, the pairs of wires that are uh, tied together. I twisted everything to get the loops into a spiral shape with a half turn. It takes a bit of time, but it's not that difficult. Start with putting a short screw into the upper collar to keep it from turning. I, I guess you could glue it, but I, I use the screw in case I needed to take this thing apart again. And then you twist and turn everything else little by little until you get the half turn spiral. Um, that means twisting the collars, sliding the collars, turning the uh, uh, spokes just a little bit. Once I got the proper shape, I put small screws into the other collars. Be sure to set the bottom collars to make the proper half turn and then arrange the middle collars for the best spiral shape. Now that the antenna is built, it's time to see what it looks like electrically. I used a PVC coupling to splice in some additional PVC mast and then I clamped it to some concrete blocks to hold it upright. I used about 25 feet of the same high quality coax to reach my workbench where I had my nano VNA being controlled by an application called Nano VNA Server on my laptop computer. Nano VNA Server is a very nice free program for controlling a nano VNA. I calibrated the nano VNA with the calibration units being at the far end of the coax to get it as close as I could to the antenna. Not only does nano VNA server uh, make things easier for operating the nano VNA, but it also has the ability to save the data from each sweep to what's called a touchstone file. And that's basically a three column text file uh, with each line having the frequency and S parameter values for each data point. Nano VNA server is a free download from the internet. And another free application is, uh, from, that's, that was written by uh, Ham called AC, or with the call sign AC6LA. Uh, it's called Zplots. And it can import, import a touchstone file and then generate a very nice plot for you. Uh, the combination of nano VNA server and Zplots is a, is a really cool combination. Here's the SDR or SWR plot of the nano VNA server data that I got as displayed by Zplots. I was targeting 146 megahertz and got really close. Uh, it's probably worth pointing out that the first time I built a QFH for two meters like this, it was just a bit long and the SWR dip was about 2% lower in frequency than I wanted. So I built this QFH with 2% shorter wires and I got almost exactly what I wanted. Uh, that repeatability uh, I think says a lot about the dependability of this design. If you build the QFH per this description it should have a reasonable likelihood of success. And these are the dimensions I used. The dimensions for the hole spacing and the spokes uh, the distance from the hole to the uh, near end of that spoke, that takes into account the 17 millimeter radius of the PVC tube. That means that the diameter of each spiral loop would be twice the sum of 17 millimeters plus the hole spacing. Um, so I hope you can understand that. That's, that, that all takes into account the uh, diameter of the PVC tube and allows for that uh, in this, in where the holes in the uh, in the fiberglass spokes are. 
Here's the plot of the feed point series resistance, uh, R sub S, and the series reactance, X sub S. Uh, as we wanted, the reactance was almost completely cancel at the desired frequency. If you check out the information <coughs> bar at the bottom of the plot, um, that shows the actual data at the frequency where the vertical line is on the plot. And I tried to put that vertical line uh, at the SDR, uh, SWR dip. I had built a almost identical QFH antenna for 400 or for 145 megahertz, and it's now sitting on top of my roof. It's almost identical to this one that you see here. <coughs> The only real difference is that I built that one with slots in the end of the spokes instead of the holes. And I used a slightly different chassis mount uh, SO239 connector for the uh, connection at the top. Um, but those slots made it harder to build since the wires kept springing out of the slots. So that's why I switched to the to holes in the spokes. Um, it was also a little bit low in frequency. So I trimmed it across the corners. I just bridged the corners with some loops to make the effective loop shorter. Um, but overall, this version with the holes is a lot way, better way to go. But it's on the roof and it works. Here's a pair, picture of the pair of QFH antennas on my roof. Uh, the one for two meters that I just described and <clears throat> then the other for 70 centimeters that uh, I described how to build in the other video. Using just those two Q, QFH antennas, I've made several contacts on either the ISS uh, 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 space station, which has an FM repeater on it, uh, or on the Russian RS-44 satellite, which is a linear transponder for single sideband and CW. I've only been doing this casually for the last couple of weeks. Uh, as I said, I'm not obsessive about this. But even so, I've made contacts uh, as far away as Pennsylvania from here in southern Arizona. And it's pretty easy to make contacts around the uh, uh, southwest here. For transmit, I use an old FT100D at 50 watts out, uh, which is probably more power than I need. Um, and I, that's for, the, for, for those two satellites, the ISS and the uh, Russian RS-44. They use a two meter uplink um, so I use the FT100D to transmit uh, on two meters for that. And then I use an SDR Play RSPDX software defined radio that's running SDR console. Uh, it's uh, the receiver application. I use that for the 70 centimeter downlink. I get a nice spectrum display on receive. Um, plus I, can, I get full duplex that way. I can see my own transmissions. Um, it works, and you can verify that from this video screen capture that I made of a contact, a recent contact, via the RS-44 satellite. Um, the ham that I made the contact with is N6OVP, as you should be able to hear from the uh, video here. Well, that's pretty much it. Thanks for watching, and I hope this video proves useful for you.